Well, good morning. We have been going through this series on forgiveness, and hopefully we're getting a better picture of God's forgiveness towards us. But today is a little bit of a transitional Sunday because we're going to start talking about how we do forgiveness with one another. And uh, I've sort of set this up so that we would fully understand the forgiveness that we have through Jesus Christ to start off this series. And we're, today we're starting to transition into how to actually do interpersonal forgiveness with one another. And some of us in some of our situations, and, I, and I'm just speaking for myself, sometimes we're in a relationship and all of a sudden it seems to be going off the deep end and we are, we're, we're hurt, we're feeling betrayed, we're confused, we don't even know why this has happened, and all of a sudden we wake up and we're just like, what in the world is going on? All we know is there is something that has changed in this relationship and it could be in the context of a, of a marriage, it could be in the context of just family and, and friends, but all we know is that I used to be friends with this person and I'm not anymore. What does God say about this? And I think you're like me and we, we don't like being in those places. And these are relational messes and we don't really sometimes know how to get out of them. Well, there's a number of places in the Bible where it actually talks about this. And today we're going to uh, start this walk, this journey through learning how to forgive one another. And uh, yes, we can receive forgiveness from Jesus Christ, as we talked about in our very first Sunday as we talked about this, is that this, this forgiveness that we've received from Jesus, we need to be able to forgive others. And that's a, a very important distinction of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So how do we do this? Well, today we're going to talk about the five causes of interpersonal problems as laid out in the book of James. Uh, the book of James is a very practical book, and it really lays out for us the source of all of these problems. And as we unpack this today and in the coming weeks as we continue to talk about what it means to give, uh, forgive interpersonally, so let me read uh, from chapter 4 in James in verses 1 to uh, 4. It says this, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is so nitty gritty. Like it's so much where the rubber meets the road in our daily lives. And I don't know about you, I'm going to assume this about all of us, that all of us have been in a conflict at some point in time. There has been some kind of quarrel, whether it's with your kids, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your boss. We all get in these places of a quarrel. And interpersonal problems become real. <laughs> all of a sudden, here they are. And we're in conflict. Well, we're going to go through these five causes, and the first cause is this. These interpersonal problems are real because I have a clash of desires. I want you to notice right there in verse 1, it just says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? And then it answers the question. It says, is it not this? And then it says that your passions, we could also change that to the word desires, or we could also use pleasures, are at war within you. And some translations will say uh, they are uh, at war among you. And what he's talking about here is that there's a clash of desire. And for some of us, this clash of desire is happening inside of us. We've got a conflict internally between the flesh and the Spirit of God. But if that sort of spills out, out of our life, we, we get into this situation where we can have an external conflict between people. 
And everyone has desires. It's not wrong to have a desire. And biblically speaking, when we understand what desire actually is, desires are, as a Christian, are to be before the Lord and to go to the Lord and be hungering and thirsting after the Lord. We're to desire Him with all of our heart. But I know and you know that sometimes these desires get out of whack and we start desiring things for ourselves. And when we get into this situation where we have these desires that are conflicting, we have a problem. So what do you do with your desires? Do you control them or do you let them run wild? And I know for a fact, because I've spent enough time in pastoral counseling, that whenever there's a conflict in a marriage, it's because there's a conflict of desire. I know the same when it comes with kids. There's a conflict in desire. I know that in the church there's a conflict of desire when there is conflict. And it's not wrong to have these desires as long as they are sanctified and set apart by God. And as, as mature Christians, we should be able to have uh, different desires and have a conversation about them. But sometimes we don't have that conversation. And how we respond to our desires is the base level to how we respond to interpersonal conflict, the interpersonal problems. And if you are of the opinion that your desire is the most important in a situation, you are going to have so many problems in your life. And you might say, ah, I don't know that I can accept that people are allowed to have different desires. Well, God has made us all unique, and he's given us abilities and personalities to make us different. I like red, you like pink. Or maybe you like purple. I hate Brussels sprouts. I hate them with the passion. You may love them. You may desire to have this mountain full of Brussels sprouts. Well, guess what? Do not serve them to me, please. I might eat them out of just being kind, but I don't like them. And it's okay. It's okay to have these different desires. But what do you do with them when they're different? You see, if you are in this position where you got to have your desire, you got to have it more than anything else, then, then just hear this. You are a controlling, narcissistic sociopath. And these are real. These are real people. You may work with them. These are people who are constantly getting into trouble and they have a desire to make trouble and cause problems to other people. They're drama queens, divas, who find meaning in life by constantly being in conflict. And more than likely, you've got some of these people that are there in your life. And I've talked to enough people that I know that even some of them are in your families and that's very difficult to deal with. And they are unrepentant about their choices. They don't feel sorry about their desires. They want their desire to be fulfilled no matter what. And they're unforgiving to people because their desires are way more important. And here they are in this place of conflict because they've got a differing desire. And this is a huge problem. It's a huge cause of why people get into this place where forgiveness and repentance has to be there to bring healing. And you may not realize this, but when we have these clash of desires, what's really in your heart is going to come out. And if we've got these clashes of desires and we're really not talking about them, we're just wanting our desire, we're going to, it's going to lead to this place of of struggling with forgiveness and not being able to find repentance because we're so fixated on our desires. I want what I want. And this is, this is sort, of the, sort of the first box as we go through this because there's actually, in this text, it's a growing desire, a growing um, propensity to create interpersonal problems. But if we can just catch ourselves at this level and start to apply the Word of God to our lives, it can actually be, work out to be okay to not have the interpersonal problems. And we have to recognize that everybody has different desires, and that's okay. God created us differently. 
I don't have to have my way. But if I do want to have my way, it leads to the second cause. And this one is what normally happens. And here's the second cause. Interpersonal problems are real because I sin when I don't get what I want. I want you to notice in verse 2, as James is writing this very practical letter, he says, you desire and do not have, so you murder. Isn't that so much what we do? <laughs> I have this desire, and I think it's a good desire, but I can't get it for whatever reason, so the first thing I decide to do is sin. And in the context, it says, so you murder. That's killing somebody. Now, a lot of the times we don't literally grab a knife and go and kill someone. But we actually think and behave in a certain way that would push in that direction. Because anytime we're not considering the needs of others when we're putting ourselves forth, that's very similar to murder. But then the text actually doesn't finish there. It continues on, and it says you covet. And what is covetousness? Well, covetousness is just this. It's desire out of control. And so here you are, you're in this situation where you have this desire and it's not being fulfilled and so you sin and you covet even more. You sort of let this desire go all over the place. And this is where forgiveness comes in. Because if I don't get what I want and I sin against somebody, that person that I just sinned against needs to forgive me. And even greater yet, myself, as a person who sinned against another person, needs to find repentance for that. And if I can't find forgiveness, if I've been sinned against, or if I can't find repentance, we've got a major interpersonal problem. And you know, it, this is human nature. We're actually not wired this way. From birth, we've been wired to get what we want, right? You all know the story of the little two-year-old. My kids were like this, you know. They want a cracker. And the little girl in Sunday school has a cracker, and they walk over and they steal it from them. Or, or they want a toy, and they can't get the toy, so they pick up another toy and smack them on the head. You know? That's us. We attack people. If we're not being led by the Spirit, that's exactly what you're going to do when you don't get what you want. You're going to attack somebody, and it actually says right here that there is a war going on. That's pretty strong language. But it's very interesting when we think about quarrels and fights and wars. It's a conflict where people are attacking people. You pick sides. You defend yourself. You destroy people. You cut them down. Boy, does that ever sound like a husband and wife argument. Because we sin against each other. And this happens all the time in marriages. In fact, I think that these types of things are the real reasons why people get divorced. It has nothing to do with finances. It has nothing to do with work and everything. It has everything to do with the fact that people are sinning against each other because they don't get what they want. In the workplace, why do people quit their jobs? Why do people get fired? It's because of this. Your neighbor that's fighting over the fence line, your friends, and in church, why do churches split? It's because of this. It's because we sin when we don't get what we want. And when we sin, forgiveness and repentance must flow in a relationship for reconciliation to actually happen. And you may wonder how you get into this place. Well, somewhere, somebody has sinned. And we need to be able to work through this. And if we are stuck in the middle of this and we're just kind of going along with Whatever we want, we're going to continue to make the situation worse. But every, hear this, every cause, there's always a way out. There's always a way out. When we recognize that we've got different desires, it's time to just stop and say, okay, it's okay. Let's talk about this as rational people. It's okay for you to have that desire. It's okay for me to have that desire. 
And when we sin against someone, there's a, way, there's a way to get out of that, and that is just go to God and just say, God, would you forgive me? And then go to the person and say, what I just said to you, it was wrong. But here's the thing. It actually takes a humble person to do this. And it takes a person that's willing to value interpersonal relationships. And those are the places where we move in repentance and where we actually forgive people and not charge them with the wrong that they actually have done. And if we recognize these things as we go along, we can move into forgiveness and inter interpersonal reconciliation quicker. But most of us are like what James is writing about, and we, after we've sinned against somebody because we don't know what we want, we go even deeper. And he addresses this next. He then goes on to say, you covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. This is so much like us. Interpersonal problems are real because we don't pray about the situation, and that's our third cause. Yeah, we don't pray. It actually says there in verse 2 that you don't have your desires because you don't ask God. You never pray about your life. It's just you. It's me, myself, and I. I'm, I'm just wanting what I want. I'm not really taking the situation over to God. I'm not praying to God about the situation. But prayer helps work out situations of conflict. Prayer helps love your enemy. And yeah, when you're in a conflict, you really feel like this person you're in conflict with or this interpersonal problem that's going on is an enemy. And someone who's actually attacking you, just like it says you're at war with them, <laughs> they are your enemy. Because they're attacking you. Do you pray about that? The scriptures actually tell us that we're to love our enemy. And how you get to a place where you can actually love your enemy is to pray for them. But that's normally not what we do in an interpersonal conflict. In fact, by this time in the conflict when our desires are not being met and we've sinned against the person, we're trying to figure out their motivations so that we can justify ourselves in what we've done. But the text actually says what we really need to be doing is praying. Praying to love our enemy. Praying to bring the Spirit of God, the wisdom of God, into the situation so that the conflict is resolved. That the interpersonal problem is taken care of. But as James writes here, and this is a, the apostle that's writing this, and he's just kind of looking at the church, and here's the thing, this is not written to the world outside. This is written to the church. He's just looking at the church, and he's saying, you know, this is what happens in the context of relationships. Prayer also helps by reflecting on the other person's desires. What, what is going on here, God? And asking him, would you please speak to the situation? And you know, this is where we get ourselves so bent about focusing on ourselves and not focusing on God. Because the Word of God in Psalms, it actually tells us that God will give you the desires of your heart. But there's a first part of that that we sort of miss. And it says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. You see, it's okay. God knows that we have these desires. God knows that there's a part of us that He to do certain things. But if we're not spending the time to pray about these things, guess what? We are doing exactly what James is talking about here. We're creating interpersonal problems. We are just going down the road without thinking that God has a say in anything that's going on. But prayer brings us to this place where we're aligning ourselves with God's will. But if we don't want to align with God, we're not going to pray. And that's exactly what happen, happens most of the time. We get into this situation and we see that there's desires at play. I'm not getting my desire. Then I just go and I sin against the person. And I'm not thinking about praying at all because I'm just focused on what I want. 
And all that does is just create space for people to have to forgive one another, for people to have to repent. It creates space for unforgiveness, and it creates space for hard-heartedness to people that don't want to actually say sorry for what they've done and recognize what they are doing. And this, this, <laughs> this is happening all the time. And it even happens in the church. It happens so much in the world. In fact, every conversation probably has at some degree, if you listen closely at work or wherever you are, and you hear people talk about their problems with people, you're going to hear these things. You're going to hear what they've done to each other. You're going to hear what they haven't done and their motivations, and they don't even know what their motivations are. Here's the fourth cause. And again, these are just, these are just getting deeper, okay? And, and you'll notice in the text, it, 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 it's got this, this is what happens first, and then you desire and you do not have, and then you do this, and then and you do not have because uh, you're not asking. And then, it says, and then it says this in verse 3. It says you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. That's a problem, isn't it? You see, interpersonal problems are real and they get even more complicated because I'm praying for my, my selfish desires. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own pleasure. And this is where people, and you know, this, this sounds, this almost sounds so religious. You know, from the outside, you might even have this conversation, well, I'm in, uh, I'm in a little bit of a problem with my spouse, but I'm praying about it. That sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? Meanwhile, what's actually happening is the person is praying these very selfish prayers. Like, God, would you get my wife on board? Right. We, we do that sometimes. We do that. And we're, we're really not praying about what God wants. We're really praying for what we want. And we're telling God what he should be doing. And this kind of praying is just, it's, selfish prayer. And it's not persevering prayer. And in fact, this is usually what happens when we're, we're, we've gone down this road where like, I can't get what I want. I'm now sinned against them. Well, that's not working. Uh, the prayer doesn't work. And, and because I've tried that and it's not happening the way I want, we start to get angry and frustrated and it just escalates even more because God is not moving on our timetable. He's not answering our prayers. The reason why he's not answering your prayers or my prayers is because we're praying for ourselves, as James tells us. And then we, then we get even worse, and we get even more bent out of shape, and we're like, God, you're the problem. You won't answer. If we would just take a step back and realize that we're just praying for ourselves, and we're asking wrongly to spend it on ourselves. And usually what happens in a situation like this, we may pray for a little bit, but we just stop. We just give up. Now the other, <laughs> the other side is that we continue praying selfishly, but not really praying because praying is actually a two-way conversation, and we stop praying and we just start telling God. And for many of us, that's maybe what our prayer life looks like. God, I wish you would just fix my cousin Aunt Betty. I got to go out with her. I'm going for a dinner, and she's going to be there, and oh, she just drives me crazy. God, would you fix her? <laughs> Come on. We pray like that sometimes. And meanwhile, all we're doing is creating deeper levels of interpersonal conflict, and we're not moving in forgiveness and repentance the way that God has called us to. And what's so dangerous about this one, where we're praying for selfish pleasures, is we actually think, I'm so spiritual, I'm praying about this. Praying for this thing to happen. Meanwhile, God is like, um, nope. You're not praying according to my will, and he's cutting through all the noise of your prayer and saying you're praying for your own pleasure, not for what I want in this situation. And this... <laughs> It is going to create all kinds of interpersonal conflict in your life. When you're praying, 
for somebody else based on your selfish desires. We just have to stop. We just have to stop praying for ourselves. And if we want to bring, so we're going to get to this place. We're going to be talking about the ministry of reconciliation that Christ has given to us. We are his ambassadors. Reconciliation is about reconciling different parties, parties that are enemies with each other. And our job as followers of Jesus Christ, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, is to step into those places and bring reconciliation. And we need to know how to do this in our own lives, but even more so in the lives of the people around us. And sometimes that means parents stepping in and being reconciling between two siblings. Sometimes that means in the workplace. It means that we need to step out and be reconciling because of differences in the workplace. And be these ministers who are reconciling people around. Because that's what our ministry is as followers of Jesus Christ. And today, this, we're just sort of laying this framework for us to help understand how we go about this in a biblical way so that God empowers and fills His Spirit into the situation. And it first starts with just recognizing that these desires are there and that somebody along the line has sinned against the other person and they're not even praying about it. And, and we shouldn't have the expectation that people that are in the world that don't even believe in God are praying about this, but we can. As followers of Jesus, we can pray, not selfishly. And, and we can even come in as a third party, and I think this is, you know, really clear in situations where it's sort of outside of us, the conflict. And maybe it's in your family. Maybe two siblings in your family. They're all grown up. And there's two siblings in your family. Every time you get together for a family function, they're always, they're always fighting. And so a prayer might look like this, you know. You're getting ready to spend Christmas with them or you're getting ready to, to go and spend time with them and you're like, well, God, could you just have so-and-so and so-and-so not fight today? We pray like that. And we pray like that so that we don't actually have to deal with the mess. Like, God, would you take this mess away from me? Just take it away. I don't want it. That's just selfish prayer, people. We need to be able to wade into the mess and say, you know what? I'm here to be a minister of reconciliation. You may not want to be reconciled, and I might not be this forceful or this blunt in saying this, but I'm here to bring reconciliation. And that's the call of a believer. <laughs> Jesus has reconciled us to God for that very thing. And we need to be about reconciling people to one another. Here's the last cause of interpersonal problems. And this one is just so clear. Is where I choose the world over Jesus. So as James is writing this, he sort of has a very condemning statement here in verse 4. And remember, he's not talking about the people of the world. He's talking about the church. He's talking about people that are believers. He says, you adulterous people. You see, these people that he was writing to, they were being friends with the world and not with God. And he made it very clear to them in, in verse 4. He says, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And at every, le at every level of every conflict, it eventually gets to this point. And the church, even worse so, because at this point, uh, people in the church, and this is what happens when churches split, by the way. <laughs> people are so bent about being friends of the world that they just kind of totally disintegrate whatever God is doing. God allows it because we are humans, we are sinful, and he allows us to have choice. He is still sovereign over those choices, and he works all things together for his good. But we often choose the world over Jesus. And I, I just want to challenge each of us this morning, myself included, the next time you're having a discussion with a spouse, with a family member, uh, with a neighbor, with anybody at work, and you start to realize, oh, I think I'm in conflict here. 
is to go through this passage and just ask yourself, you know, am I, am I wanting my desires so much that I'm willing to sin to get them? And have I taken the time to actually pray about this other person? A am I praying that I would love them, that they would see the love of Jesus in me? And am I really praying for them and not for my own selfish desires? Because <laughs> you're going to get to a place if you're not doing these things where you're cho choosing the world over you're choosing God. And in that context, James says, you're an adulterous person. You're choosing the things of the world more than you're choosing God. And I totally get that for someone who's not a believer. Yeah, I get that you can be in the workplace and you can be sinning against people and, and not praying about it, not really caring because you want what you want, what you want. Yeah, you're choosing the world. And I don't have that expectation that they're going to do anything differently. But we as followers of Christ are challenged, are called to do things differently, to live life differently. Because this is what happens. Let me just, I'm just going to play this out for you when we choose the world over Jesus. We choose unforgiveness. We choose bitterness. We choose retaliation. We choose resentment. We choose envy. We just continue sinning. We become hard-hearted because we're unrepentant. We don't say things like, I'm sorry. And that leads us to this place where we've got a massive problem. And there's actually studies today that when you get to this place of bitterness and you get to this place of retaliation and resentment, that it actually physically affects your body. The reason why people have ulcers is because of this. The reason why people struggle, and I'm not saying that this is the only reason, by the way, because he's here beyond this. But the reason we have some of our health concerns is because of this. We're stressed out because we don't want to go and see Aunt Susie. And we don't know how to deal with this mess. But when we choose Jesus, we choose forgiveness. We choose repentance. We choose reconciliation. We're like wanting. We have this deep desire to bring reconciliation to the people around us. We want to be that peacemaker where we're making peace wherever we go and we want to pray for people because we understand that God has not called humanity to live like this. And in fact, this is the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came, he died on the cross to redeem us from the brokenness of this world and to set us free so that we know what it means to be reconciled, to not be enemies with God, with the holy God, and then to transfer that into all of our personal relationships where we're not enemies where we are respecting one another of their desires and what they want. And we're loving each other and praying for each other according to the will of God. And the only way that that's actually going to happen is that we recognize what gets us to these places where, where we need to forgive and where we need to repent. Because I think a lot of times in our interpersonal problems, we find ourselves in these places and we don't know how we got there. And if we don't know how we got there, then we actually can't keep ourselves from going deeper into these problems. And, and I'll just challenge every, every couple that's here this morning, and even if you're single and you're divorced or whatever that situation is, you, you've got somebody that you're in relationship with. But I want to challenge all of us in our relationships this morning that we would not be the cause of interpersonal problems. <laughs> that we would actually be these peacemakers and bring Jesus into the situation and not be so focused on our desires, but think about what God can do in our desires.
And, and for some of us, that also means that we may have to actually go to our spouse, go to our kids and say, you know what, I was wanting this and I wasn't really listening to you and then I went and sinned against you. Would you forgive me? And when we start to behave and act like this, this whole thing of interpersonal relationships becomes a joy, not a burden, not hard, because God is giving us the strength to go through it. And not everybody is on this page. Let me just say this disclaimer, and we're going to get to, as we go through this series, how do you reconcile with somebody that doesn't want any kind of reconciliation with you? Okay, we're going to get there. But for us, for each of us today, it's really about are we being that person who wants to reconcile, who wants to bring interpersonal problems to an end and have peace in our relationship? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He set us free from the bondage of sin through the forgiveness of sin so that we could enjoy him forever. So my challenge, my challenge this morning is that we would actually just choose Jesus. Choose Jesus at every situation, in every interpersonal situation that you can think of. At every moment that comes along, take that step back and say, am I choosing Jesus right now or am I choosing myself over Jesus? And I know <laughs> the good news, the good news is that Jesus meets us in these places. And we need to be equipped so that we can actually go out and be these ministers of reconciliation that God has called us to be. So let's, let's just pause in prayer this morning and uh, take a minute and just ask God, that he would use us to be ministers of reconciliation and, and to apply the forgiveness he's given to us, to the people around us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is instructive and that your word is true to all matters of faith and life. God, I do not want to be the cause of interpersonal problems. And I believe that my brothers and sisters that are gathered here this morning desire the same thing. So God, I pray that you would open our eyes so that we would not be the cause of interpersonal problems, but that we would bring the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God into interpersonal problems and be your peacemakers in all of those situations. God, I pray this morning as we have talked about this that if we are in conflict with you, God, that we would get that right, right away. And that we would turn to you and give ourselves to you and commit our lives to following you being faithful to you and confessing our sins to you and having the freedom and the grace that is poured out into our lives through forgiveness. But then God, just burn in our hearts the desire to take all of that and bring it to the people around us. God, I pray that we as a church, as individuals, could be ministers of reconciliation to be peacemakers wherever we go, bringing the love of Jesus to every human interaction. And God, we can't do this on our own. It's only through your word. It's only through your spirit. It's only by your grace that this can happen. So we ask you to bring it to pass. And we pray all of this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.